number you have dialed. Catching the tune. I'm fickle my heart and now losing my eyes. I struggle to find the truth in your lies. And now my heart stumbles on things I don't know. The weakness I feel is finally shown. When you realize I can change what you see. But your soul you must keep totally free. Welcome to another episode of A Little Bit of Sugar, Old Tommy Radio Show. Today I am reading Running on Empty by Patrick F. McManus. So gather round, snuggle in, and picture this, if you will. Some of the boys and I were sitting around Kelly's bar and grill the other evening, stretching and varnishing a few truths about our adventures in the great outdoors when Kelly himself hauled a round of iced schooners over to our table and sat down. He listened to our conversation for a few moments, shaking his head in a pretty good impression of annoyance, and then muttered, Fish hunt, fish hunt, can't you guys ever talk about anything else? You don't much care for outdoor sports, do you, Kelly? Rich Sweeney asked. Oh, you guys are all right. It's just that I can't understand what you see in hunting and fishing. Man, this stuff is boring. Maybe to you it's boring. Sweeney put in. But to us, it's exciting. (laughs) Exciting. Listen, I know. I fished once. It's boring. Is not. Is. Said Kelly. Okay, wise guys. Tell me. What is the most exciting thing about fishing and hunting? I thought for a moment. Running out of gas. Running out of gas? Asked Kelly, astonished. I would have thought something like being chased by a big bear. That's a good one, too, I said. But for absolute, undiluted, marrow-chilling excitement, it's running out of gas. I can't believe I'm sitting here listening to this nonsense. Kelly snarled. With that, he got up and stomped back to the bar to spit polish some glasses. Like Kelly, most people unfamiliar with outdoor sports find it hard to believe that running out of gas is the most exciting part of hunting and fishing. That's because they only know about the typical, mundane experience of running out of gas on a well-traveled highway, such as happened to me just the other day. On my way home from a business trip, I thought I could make it across the desert without being ripped off for a tank full at one of those seedy last chance for gas places that loiter on the edge of deserts. A mere 15 miles from the next gas station, my car choked, coughed a few times, and then choked to a stop. Heat waves rippled up from the empty horizon, and gusts of searing wind sandblasted my car. It was all I could do to keep from laughing. You call this running out of gas, I said, to the fates that govern such things. This is child's play. I then nonchalantly flagged down the 87th car to pass, a vehicle driven, as I judged, by a recent escapee from an institution for the criminally insane. The man's conversation was diverting, based, as it was, on a considerable expertise in the use of poisons, stilettos, hatchets, and pipe bombs. Some twenty months later, we arrived at the gas station, where he dropped me off. When I thanked him for the ride and for sparing my life, he snapped his fingers, as though reminded of something he had forgotten, then drove off in a huff, apparently much disgusted with himself. The gas station attendant, on the other hand, proved difficult. He said his station had a policy against providing any aid whatsoever to travelers in perilous distress, including the learning out of tools the restroom key, or containers in which to carry gas back to stranded vehicles. Without much coaxing, however, he agreed to sell me a rusty little gas can, a family heirloom, he said, which his great-grandfather had had handcrafted of rare metals by a team of silversmiths imported from Switzerland. Snatching up my heirloom gas can, I hoofed it back to my car in a trice, or, to be more specific, four hours and ten minutes. Although the trek was long and hot, 
the buzzard circling above, did afford some shade, and I could not help but think how accustomed we were to zipping mindlessly along in our shiny tin capsules, totally oblivious to the ever-changing face of nature. And what a good thing that is, too. For an outdoorsman, though, that sort of running out of gas doesn't even rank as a nuisance, let alone excitement. It requires no skill, no finesse. It is an accident, a result of faulty judgment, a miscalculation. The outdoorsman cannot leave such an important part of his application to mere chance. He must plan and practice his routine until he gets it perfect. Then, finally, when he has mastered the art, he can drive his vehicle to the far end of a wilderness canyon and, some fifty miles or so beyond the boundaries of the known world, with night closing in and storm clouds rising, turn to his companions and, with just the right degree of flair, announce, <laughs> Well, <laughs> I think we're out of gas. Nothing so stirs the emotions and invigorates the vitals of an outdoorsman as that announcement particularly when it is enhanced by a sappy, bug-out expression on the face of the announcer. Once the announcement has been made, the tradition is that the other people in the car are supposed to respond in unison. Oh, you bleep! Sometimes, though, they merely sit there, slack-jawed, staring at the gas gauge in disbelief. Also, on occasion, they will choose to unwind with a bit of horseplay, such as taking turns chasing the vehicle's driver and trying to hit him with the nearest stick. There are numerous ways of running out of gas in the wilderness. One of the best is to run over a large, sharp rock that punctures your gas tank. This method usually affords a much greater degree of surprise, since all the gas dribbles quietly out onto the ground while you are away from the car getting cold, hungry, and exhausted. It is considered poor form, however, to clap your hands and emit happy yelps of surprise over the discovery that you have ruptured your gas tank on some sharp rocks. The time is better employed getting a head start down the road while your companions are still selecting the sticks and testing them for tinsel strength. The problem with the punctured gas tank method is that you can't always depend on finding large, sharp rocks in the right places. Thus. Running out of gas, a sufficient distance out in the boonies to qualify you as a master of the art, becomes largely a matter of chance. The punctured gas tank is fine, if the opportunity offers itself, but should not be counted upon. The so-called shortcut, on the other hand, is practically foolproof, and I highly recommend it. The shortcut is usually recalled by one of the members of the party as a road he had been told about in a bar by a fellow who discovered it while huckleberry picking with his family at age six. The shortcut sounds like a reasonable option to the driver, particularly if he hasn't filled his quota for running out of gas that year. It will cut down our driving time in half, he explains, and of course, it does. The rest of the time is spent walking, usually up an incline that appears to be leading to the Continental Divide. Another good method involves the use of an auxiliary gas tank. When the vehicle stalls, the driver says to his nervous companion, Oh, oh, well, it looks like we're out of gas. Allowing himself the enjoyment of seeing perspiration beat up nicely on the passenger's forehead, the driver then chuckles and says, ha, only joking. Now I'll just switch over to the auxiliary tank. The trick here, of course, is to have neglected to check the auxiliary tank after your kid borrowed your vehicle to go out for pizza and failed to mention that the pizza was on the other side of the state. Because your partner may not see the humor in this situation, you should be prepared to entertain him with some of your impersonations of famous personalities. The next best thing to running out of gas is almost running out of gas. Fraught with suspense, these trips are often referred to as white knucklers. The term is derived from the driver's tendency to increase the tightness of his grip on the steering wheel in direct ratio to the rate the gas is diminishing. One theory holds that as much as 15 additional miles can be squeezed out of the steering wheel itself. 
Further mileage is gained by all the passengers rocking forward in unison and chanting, Come on, baby, come on! Chanting by itself is not good for more than two additional miles. Because it may be difficult for the non-outdoorsmen to understand the exhilaration we hunters and anglers get from running out of gas, I will give an example from my own personal experience. Al Finley, Rich Sweeney, and I just returned to my car from a fishing trip into the Hoodoo Mountains and were heading back to the main highway when I noticed the needle on the gas gauge was hovering half an inch below the empty mark. Immediately, I took the recommended emergency measure, which consists of beating on the gas gauge with your fist in an effort to get the needle to rise up to the point where you have enough gas to get home. I then fell back on squeezing the steering wheel while Rich and Al rocked and chanted, but it was of no avail. The engine inhaled the last vapors from the carburetor and died. We sat there for a few moments coining some colorful phrases, and then Al asked the unusual question. Well, what are we going to do now? Beats me, I said. I got an idea. Rich said. How far back? That big old house, you figure. The one we passed, not so far back. About five miles, I'd guess. Al said. You mean that big, spooky old house with the porch caving in and the shingles falling off? I asked, hoping to diffuse the hostility in the car with some casual conversation. Boy, I wonder what kind of person lives in a place like that. Pretty darn weird, I'd bet. And those dogs. Did you see those two big wolfy dogs standing under that sign that said, Trespassers will be shot? I wonder what they were gnawing on, looking as it was like it was wearing a hat. Oh boy, I would no more go into that place than... What? What do you mean, it's my fault? No, no, they they probably wouldn't have any gas anyway, and... A few hours later, I was back at the car with a can of gas. One of my pants legs was missing, and the back had been ripped out of my shirt. Fortunately, I had finally been able to lose the dogs by circling through a swamp and wading up a creek before scaling the cliff. The sense of exhilaration was marvelous. For the first time since running out of gas on Bald Mountain, I felt fully and truly alive, except for the lower half of my body, which seemed pretty well shot. Any trouble? Al asked. None to speak of, I said. Just the usual. Fellow lives in that house, said Rich. Pretty weird, was he? Just the usual. He wouldn't take any pay for the gas, though. No kidding. Yeah, but be careful of that can. It's a family heirloom. All right, campers, I hope you enjoyed the show, and thanks for listening. <laughs>